everyone. Um, so I think we can start. So my name is Julia Zahreddin. I am the Equity and Advocacy Advisor for Cohere. And I am really happy to introduce you to our workshop number two on recruiting, hiring, and onboarding people of forced displacement. So before we start, uh, let me share a few housekeeping rules. Um, so first, please use the coming minutes to change your name to add the name of your organization. You can go in participants and hover over your name. You click on more or on the three dots and then you rename. You enter the name of your organization and you click on OK. Um, please note that the Q&A moment will be recorded. You can choose to uh, send your question privately to Diana uh, SX Letieri if you prefer to stay anonymous. You can chat your questions to everyone in the room if you don't mind the question being visible, or you can raise your hand to verbally express your question if you're comfortable with, um, with being publicly available, with your question being publicly available. You can use the chat box to introduce yourself, to give insights in the conversation and to ask for assistance. If you have technology problems, you can find uh, Sianua Atemi in the chat box. He will help you and he'll write a little message to say hello uh, so you can find him. And otherwise, please try to keep yourself muted um, when you're not talking during the Q&A moments and we will mute you if you come off mute. So this second uh, workshop, this workshop is the second workshop of our five-part series called Building Organizational Pathways uh, towards meaningful participation and refugee leadership. And the series focuses on clarifying concrete pathways to enact meaningful participation and refugee leadership. We previously held a session on equity learning journeys uh, in October. The recording is available on our YouTube channel. And we have three more sessions scheduled for equitable partnerships in January, funding and institutional support to RLOs in February, and support to refugee led advocacy in March. So today's session is specifically designed for our collaborative learning and growth as refugee response organizations in our practice of hiring, recruiting, and onboarding people of forced displacement. So outcomes you can expect from this session are first to gain a comprehensive understanding of the value of recruiting people of forced displacement. Second, you'll be uh, presented six strategic pathways that can help you to enhance the inclusion of people of forced displacement in your team. Throughout the session, you will also dive into innovative ideas that will help you to overcome standard challenges that can arise as you implement pathways toward better uh, recruitment, uh, hiring and onboarding of people of forced displacement. And by the end of the session, you can expect to leave with concrete and actionable insights that you can use for yourself and also take back to, or to your organization to inform its pursuit of meaningful refugee participation. So the session will kick off with a panel presentation on the inherent value of recruiting people for of forced displacement and <clears throat> on pathways to overcome legal concerns. This will be followed by an anonymized pool for data collection for advocacy purposes and by a Q&A session with the speakers. Subsequently, a second panel will delve into uh, pathways to unravel the how of recruiting and hiring um, and will provide strategies to address potential challenges. Another anonymized pool for advocacy data collection will follow and um, and this will be, uh, and you will have another Q&A session. You will then join breakout room sessions to discuss how these pathways can be made applicable to your specific organizational and local context. At the session's end, an anonymous exit survey will be circulated for your feedback. We'll ask you to please take five minutes to answer the survey so we can improve your overall learning experience. So let's start. Um, enjoy your workshop and have an insightful experience. And now let me introduce you to uh, Diana Excess Literary, our workshop moderator. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thank you so much for joining us. And thank you to Cohere for inviting me to moderate today. I am so excited about this conversation. We have some incredible experts here to guide us 
in our learning. So I am the founder and principal consultant of Diana Essex Lettieri Consulting, and I'm focusing on strategy, strategizing for equity and impact. Um, I want to take a moment to introduce our guests today, our experts, starting with Hafsar Tamusuddin, pronouns they, them. Hafsar is a former Rohingya refugee from Myanmar, the co-secretary general at Asia Pacific Refugee Rights Network, APRIN, and one of the co-founders of Rohingya Women's Collaborative Network. They are a steering committee member of the Asia Pacific Network of Refugees, APNOR, a trustee of the Refugee Leadership Alliance, a member of the Global Refugee-Led Network, and an interim working group member of the Global Movement of Statelessness. For over a decade, Hafsar has been involved in different advocacy and activism spaces on statelessness, refugee rights, asylum seekers, detention of migrants and refugees and prevention, and response to sexual and gender-based violence at regional, national, and international levels. Hafsar, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, next, we have Chris Eads, pronouns he, him. Chris is a human rights lawyer who has worked at Amira in Cairo, JRS in Thailand, St. Andrew's Refugee Services in Cairo, Asia Pacific Refugee Rights Network, APRIN, and currently at Church, Church World Service as their Asia representative. Among other accomplishments, while working as executive director of STARS, in collaboration with the leadership of many, STARS grew from a small organization with some refugee staff in certain positions and mostly with Western migrant worker managers to an organization of more than 400 staff with those from refugee backgrounds representing more than 85% of leaders and staff. Chris left STARS in 2021, handing over to a leadership team with the majority of refugee and women members. Similarly, as Secretary, Secretary General of APRIN, Chris supported the organization to transition to a co-leadership model with people of lived experience of forced displacement in top leadership positions. We are thrilled to have your expertise with us today, Chris. And lastly, Adior Ibrahim, pronouns she, her. Adior is dedicated to helping refugee response organizations build impactful strategies toward refugee leadership. Adior Ibrahim is the DEI program assistant at Cohere. In this role, she harnesses her experiences as a person of forced displacement and her work with refugee-led initiatives such as Conflict Transformation for Development South Sudan to advocate and enable more equitable practices within Cohere. Adior is a student at International Leadership University, taking up a bachelor's in science in leadership and management. Adior, we are also very excited to learn from you today. We're gonna jump into these questions. But a rem uh, reminder, based on Julia's uh, comments at the start of the hour, this is a little. This session's a little bit different in format. We have two spots for Q and A, and the first one is coming up in just twenty minutes. So please start jotting down your questions, put them in the chat box. You can send them to me directly. We really want to hear what is on your mind about what our speakers are guiding us on. So kicking us off, I want to turn it first to Hafsar. So Hafsar, setting the stage for our conversation today, uh, we want you to help us understand the big why behind hiring and recruiting people of forced displacement. So my question for you is, what is the value of hiring people of forced displacement? And what do you believe should be everyone's goal related to representation of people of forced displacement on their staff? Okay, it's working. Um, thank you so much, Diana. Um, thank you for having me um, today. So the first thing that come to my mind is the impacts that has been shown historically many times over and over again. And I have also seen myself um, on top of all the amazing introduction that you did about me. One practical thing is that I myself is a forcibly displaced person and I walk and live in Malaysia as a refugee. Um, for about nine years, so I did see all this uh, impact by by having people on board, uh, refugees and forcibly displaced people on board. Um, the immediate impact that I have seen is um, having this comprehensive, practical, and need based responses to forcibly displaced uh, men issue and as well as refugees issue. And also, one thing is that um, we have to bear in mind is these colonized people are leading the colon the decolonization process, um, and they lead the movement in. Um, in a practical way, again, sustainable way. And I have, again, as I've mentioned, witnessed in Malaysia, in many organizations, I NGO and NGO that works for forced displacement and refugees, 
um, how how practically they can uh, and also positively and timely response um, if and when they have uh, people of forced displacements and refugees on board in the work that they do. And also one thing that organizations should ask people is that um, what is the best for the people and for the community that they work and then they can then shape and design the, um, the responses accordingly um, with the people impacted by colonization at every step of uh, the process that, that require a bit of work. Also, so something that has been in, in my mind a while um, as I've been involved with this preparation of Global Refugee Forum, one thing that excites me is now one element of Global Refugee Forum this year, we're talking about resilience building and capacity building of people uh, of forced displacement and refugees. Um, and as well as this, um, one of one other value that I can see by hiring uh, people of forced displacement and refugees also will tackle the issue of social economic inclusion, as well as the inevitably um, arising this xenophobia and resentments against refugees and forced displacement in our region and beyond. Um, because People are going to be on the move. They are they are conflict in the countries, um, in Asia Pacific region, and in different part of the world. If we don't create that pathway for the people who are forcibly displaced and refugees, this resentments and xenophobia is going to be there. And unfortunately, we have seen that it's happened in the past over and over again. As well as changing the narrative of refugees and forced displacement, um, this um, element of getting people on board and hiring can be one of the key elements of changing the narrative instead of being uh, this community being seen as the burden to the host community and in countries, they can be seen as the complementary um, communities of, of the society. Uh, as well as I have seen many countries like um, Malaysia and Thailand and many other countries where I have been um, displaced for many years is that there is a huge need of um, labor and human resources um, by by having people of forced displacement and refugees with many different skills and expertise that can also be complementary to uh, many countries that are hosting refugees and forcibly displaced people. Um, as well as one, one other element that we need to think about is that if we are going to have people with forced displacement, is uh, we need to think about as well shifting the power and sharing the power, and or, or as well as the represent, representation of people will live experience and then forci forcibly displaced and refugees. Um, um, one, one other thing that also we need to think about is that we need to, people need to think about acting with integrity and acknowledging their work. Um, yes, organization, INGOs and NGOs have their resources, um, their expertise, um, but they also must acknowledge their limitation of being able to understand the the need the actual need of the communities um and if they are not understanding it if they are not the right person it's not um a big ask to to have people on uh, forced displacement on board and seeking their guidance and it is important to do so so that the work that we do is a uh, practical sustainable and need based and the responses are in that way as well um, as well as one other element that we need to look at is um, importance of intersectionality in recruitment. Um, organization need to constantly reflect, are we, um, are we diverse enough to have this intersectionality in our recruitment? It is very important for many particular minority groups that we are talking about, LGBTQI community, disabled community, and elderly, and so on and so forth. Um, one other thing as well, connection to the ground and reality. Um, language and education barrier because sometimes what I have seen in many organizational contexts is that we understand the macro level of the issue, not so much deep inside of understanding the underneath issues of macro, um, micro level of the issue. So it's really important to have people of us displacement on board um, to guide us and inform us to really understand the reality on the ground and then to shape and design the work that we do, again, need based and, and practical and sustainable way. Um, that require a lot of um, plenary work and working together with the, also working together with the communities as well. How do we make this um, designing about onboarding people um, of forced displacement in the process and consultation as well? Over Diana. I really appreciate the clarity that you've provided for the, impacts at both very macro level for a, a whole population and also at a very micro level for how the work gets better and stronger. 
in looking around within, I'm glad you brought up the Global Refugee Forum and looking around in spaces like this, we are seeing, uh, for those of us who are, are in these spaces, we're seeing a growing trend, trend to care about representation. So there's more people in these spaces calling for meaningful participation, more people interested in having people of forced displacement on panels or launching advisory bodies. Um, and like UNHCR, for example, I'm curious, what do you think about such initiatives? What do they achieve and what do they not achieve? This conversation is about representation on staff. And so trying to understand how these external engagements are a value and how they're a value and how is it different or complementary to having people on staff? Well, <laughs> that's a very good question. Yeah, it's, it's always interesting to think about um, meaningful refugee participation and where are we? Uh, meaningful participation of people with live experience, how do we do that? So from my observation until this point, it is the tip of the iceberg and a very surface level. Um, the advisory bodies, it's great to have them, but then what we need to really um, think about is that... Um, they are valuable if they are not um, tokenized. Um, so many, so many structures shift needs to happen in order to put power back in people's hand because you can have an advisory body. Sometimes you give the people the position, then oftentimes what I've seen is that you then take away their agency, their ability to speak, to actually be able to contribute. So it can as well be for some NGOs and organization can be a showcase. Now we have this meaningful participation element, um, then it, it will then put them in a position of, you know, not being um, criticized enough. And um, to be, in a way, it is, if, how do I put this, in a, in a defensive position now. We have it, we are doing it. But then in the, in the very inside, it is not happening. So as well, for people particularly who have been oppressed for many, many years in their life, for the first time, if they are given in this kind of uh, positions and if they are not empowered and trained and given with the skill how to be in the advisory body, also uh, not make them feel like safe enough to be able to contribute, make them feel um, that they are the partners, they have the equal power. Again, I'm speaking of power to have a say, it's just a showcase. It is not the real meaningful advisory body. Um, so it can fit into a tendency of creating many types of traditional governance body to hide the fact that you still hold power. And the other body of power doesn't contribute, but helps um, to showcase the people, as I've mentioned. So there's need a lot of groundwork still. Um, also, oftentimes, as I've mentioned, advisory bodies are not trained and coached. So it, they require a lot of um, appetite and willingness from the side of INGOs and organization to invest in it, to really make it meaningful, not just having an advisory body or an advisory group for the sake of having it. Oftentimes I've seen I was a part of, to be really frank and honest with you, at the at the interim advisory group of UNXCR, but I I don't think I have had a very sustainable way of contributing and ability to contribute of how how this big of INGO shape the work of meaningful refugee participation. Same. So I also want to acknowledge the little milestone that they have come so far. But I'm just reminding myself and everybody that it is just the tip of the iceberg. We still have to do a lot of internal work and reflection how this is um, working and how this is not working. Is it really meaningful enough? If we wanna make it meaningful, how do we invest in it? So um, again, um, advisory bodies are not secure position. The likelihood of hearing what needs to set feel sometime low. Also need to in, in remember about trauma in, informed engagement. Again, as I said, many people who have been forcibly displaced have many traumatic experiences prior to their displacement. So we need to remember how much we are demanding, which kind, of, which kind of position we are putting them, and are we them having the element of support for them if they need it in case this is tra re-traumatizing for them. It is triggering for them because it can be for many cases. Um, uh, again, going back to the power dynamic, you put them in the, in the position of advisory body and then if people are experiencing going through, again, the level of operation, it's, it's a very... My, it is very hard to see because when you're given that position and still going through that operation, that is difficult to be visible. It can be re-traumatizing for the people as well. Also to think about that elements. Um, also sometime, um, what I have myself experienced is that when I was a refugee, I have 
sometime been invited to many advisory boards and and group and then we were we were told to give our ideas and input how to, how to take forward for the such and such project and program or advocacy lead for the communities but then when they carry out throughout after getting our ideas we are not even mentioned we are not with them anymore they just have us to pitch the idea and from us and so it is very important again for the INGOs and INGOs to reflect how it is um, going to be meaningfully in including the people who have provided you such initial idea. Um, sometimes they take the credit um, on behalf of the ideas that they get from the advisory um, bodies. So the very least, the very least, if you cannot, because of your limitation, have the capacity of hiring these people or bringing them along all this project that they, you have got the idea from them, the very least acknowledge them, find a way of acknowledging uh, across the process. Um, we need to, again, have the integrity. Um, you know, when we do academic paper, when you cite somebody's idea, we do that citation. Otherwise, we call it uh, pl plagiarism. Now, when you get the ideas of people who have experienced and forcibly displaced people, you act it as if your own. What does it even not matter? Then they speak the volume. So there is a lot of groundwork to do as well. Um, um, saying so, I also would like to highlight one of the good uh, practices that um, happen in terms of getting and hiring people. Um, I'm sorry, you have about office. one minute, okay? Okay, one minute. One, one minute. I'll wrap it up now. Um, on both is that um, one thing when... When I was in Geneva for the first time in first Global Refugee Forum in 2019, I was with the group of um, other refugee women on gender audit team. Uh, we are um, supported by UNSW as well as um, APRIN to audit about gender and um, age diversity and stuff. So what, what is meaningful is that um, eventually UNSW and um, managed to advocate all the women, refugee women, to be um, compensated for their times in Geneva as well as there was mentorship program and then training the younger and emerging coming leaders by the senior women leaders, as well as the, the two mentors there. So there was, in a way, it is meaningful now because that work is going to be lit by the refugee women themselves when the two other people without life experience are setting aside and only supporting them. That is one good example. The other one is that uh, one um, project that APEN and UNSW in collaboration has been working on in Malaysia to empower refugee women-led organization in terms of combating SGBB and, and prevention of that. Now these women are in a stage where they are able to write their own uh, programs and they are, they are now in the position to be able to explore donors. Now we are gonna do very soon in near future, a workshop where we invite the donors to speak about the impacts of um, empowering refugee women-led organization and having them on board and how do uh, the funders and donors can find innovative ways to fund them and so that their work is um, sustainable over there. I hope I didn't go over one minute. Thank you so much. No, I'm I'm terribly sad to move away from your comments. It's so valuable. Um, this series, as we all know, is about getting very concrete about what we can do to enable the vision that you're articulating, Hafsar, around having people of forces placement on our staff uh, from our within our organizations. So Chris, I want to turn to you. Um, based on your demonstrable ability uh, to support organizations to transform leadership and constituencies, we're really looking for clarity. What can you start us off with? What are some important initial pathways organizations may want to take or consider taking prior to hiring people of forced displacement? And within your answer, really hoping that you can speak to the legal challenges that people may be facing or may perceive that they're facing. Hi, hello everyone. Thanks, Diana, uh, much appreciated. Um, it, it, it was uh, my great pleasure to, to um, serve under Hafsa. Uh, she was she was my my chair at um, they were my chair at Apron. Um, and 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 uh, um, I always thought to myself then that it would be really intimidating to speak after Hafsar speaks, and I'm now really realizing that that's that's true. I've I've always um, felt bad about people who've had to do that, and now I'm in in the position myself. But it's really good to be here this evening. Um, the 
there's one thing which I think is very likely to be true that every organization here and um, there really is um, global representation um, here, here in this meeting at the moment. But we're all doing some of the things that we're going to be talking about today. But one thing I do want to mention that we're not going to do is we're not going to solve the global problem of work rights for refugees. Um, that is beyond the scope of this meeting, unfortunately. I wish it were possible, but that's not what we're going to do. But what we are talking about is improving the recruitment of people from forcibly displaced backgrounds. And we're also talking about enhancing in inclusion. So what do we mean about improving um, recruitment? That can mean increasing levels of uh, recruitment, and that's incredibly important. And we're gonna be talking about that as well. Um, but more importantly, perhaps, it means um, improving the impact um, and the experience that people with lived experience backgrounds are able to have in the organizations that they're recruited to. That is absolutely key. Um, I have, um, I've been lucky for, for more than 10 years to be, to have been really part of the movement to bring about and to accelerate refugee leadership and participation and to support that as an ally and, and luckily to be majorly a part of it and to see the transformation um, achieved in organizations through the successful and considered recruitment um, of people with lived experience and, and particularly um, in key roles. Um, it's just before I begin, it's also really important for me to mention that the refugee just like the organizations we have on this call, the refugee experience is as broad as the human experience. Um, and, and, and so what we mean by that is that there are brilliant, expert, capable um, people with lived experience backgrounds who can walk into to CEO roles tomorrow very comfortably. Um, and then at the other end, there are people who are finding work for the first time and perhaps have had education that's been severely interrupted by displacement. And so lack formal qualifications or perhaps lack formal um, experience of the workplace. So there's a really broad range of experience. And so what I'm going to try to do today is provide some pathways, some ideas for you to consider, I'm sure as well, that you have many ideas, that there are many ideas in this meeting that would help advance what we're trying to achieve. Um, so beginning on my, um, my first pathway, um, and, and this is absolutely crucial, and that is to understand why um, you are making the decision um, to recruit people with um, lived experience of forced displacement. By asking the question why, you begin on, on what can be a long journey to understand how you're, you're going to achieve that thing. By asking why, there are many very good reasons for us to, um, to reserve positions for people with lived experience backgrounds, um, and to actively seek to recruit people from lived experience backgrounds. And they can range from representation um, through to um, improving the effectiveness and the, the, the quality of frontline programming. And everything in between those things. Um, one thing that we have to remember, recruiting refugees um, or recruiting people with lived experience backgrounds is not going to achieve any of those goals on its own. It needs to be accompanied um, by a range of measures and supports, but also incredibly importantly, by self-examination within the organization setting out on this journey, involving all staff and stakeholders about what you're trying to achieve. 
and why you're making that decision. And so you can put in place um, the supports, many of which have so, um, already spoke about many of the, the additional thinking that is necessary in order to achieve these big goals, such as improved programming or representation or improved advocacy, um, or, or whatever your particular organizational goal is. Um, I have seen the recruitment of people from lived experience backgrounds massively improve um, frontline programming. Um, in, in work that I did in Egypt, in, in, in which um, in, in one particular area, uh, we began thinking that, that we were supporting um, former unaccompanied children, now unaccompanied young people. Um, we thought that they wanted additional experience. And so we began um, training them and using them as um, teaching assistants on a very part-time basis. Following that, um, they consumed all possible knowledge available and wanted um, additional um, opportunities. We then opened up part-time youth advocacy positions for people from lived experience backgrounds, and in particular for people who've experienced life, life as an unaccompanied child. Those things alone wouldn't have been enough to achieve an improvement in program. Through the ideas and the suggestions that came from that group of staff um, and the mechanisms and supports being in place so that those suggestions were heard and understood and properly considered and then developed meant that we established programs to um, support the children uh, of children um, um, who were accessing the program, something that we hadn't properly been doing before. So there are a range of um, potential benefits, but understanding the supports that need to be in place and not expecting um, the simple act of recruitment to achieve um, miracles within your organization in terms of representation, meaningful participation, improved programming, or whatever um, the goal may be. Um, moving on to um, pathway two, and, and that is thinking about some of the mechanics of how we go about um, understanding that there are risks involved. Um, it, it is often the case that, that when, um, when we have a meeting such as this, that the first issue that comes to people's mind, particularly um, for organizations um, living and working in the global south, how is how is this possible? Because work rights are rarely um, something enjoyed by refugee populations um, in the global south. And so how, how are you able to do this? Um, you can't possibly be complying, um, complying with the law. And, and that is certainly um, gonna be a, a brief part of our discussion because we can't go into every operating context and, and, and provide strategies. It's more to provide some signposts, but there are other really important things that we can be doing no matter what your context is, where you're working, whether that's in the UK or in Uganda or in Thailand um, and, and those different settings. The first thing that I would recommend would be to understand your operating context and to check your assumptions. It is possible um, through understanding what other organizations are doing um, to understand more fully your operating, your operating context. In, um, in countries in which refugees, even recognized refugees, do not enjoy work rights, this is absolutely essential. And it's absolutely essential that you be talking to partners, but also 
that you be checking your assumptions. And, and this involves opening the existing pathways that you have to people with lived experience. Um, to give you a, a quick example of this, um, so in many contexts, it is possible for refugees to travel and IDPs to travel. It is, um, many refugees and IDPs have passports, for example, and are able to travel and are able to access international labor programs and are able to access um, work visas in um, second countries, either um, further countries of asylum or um, in countries of first asylum in, in the case of IDPs. And one of the organizations that I worked um, for was able to, to employ legally in Thailand um, someone from a Rohingya background um, who would otherwise be displaced in, in, in Myanmar. And so those, um, those things are absolutely possible. It's also important to think about and to consider um, non-traditional methods, um, methods of recruitment. And, and again here, talking to your partners to pool resources and reduce risk is incredibly important. From the beginning, I would say making for any organization that is not a refugee-led organization and initiative, it's important to know those RLOs, RLIs um, that work in your context, um, that worked in your location, and, and to be reaching out to those RLOs and RLIs and beginning to build relationships, understanding the work that they do and sharing the work that you do. Um, in non-traditional methods um, of, of recruitment, that um, becomes even more important. Um, and what I mean by reducing risk is that within um, settings in the global south, there have, in a number of places that I've worked, there have been um, a fairly um, standard response to, to, um, to a less than favourable work setting for refugees, where they, they didn't enjoy work rights, um, to provide, for example, um, stipends, volunteer stipends. Um, that was done by a number of organizations to, together, each understanding how um, the other organizations were, were navigating financial and legal compliance. And, and that can be incredibly important to establish it as a, as a customary practice. Um, when we engage the services of refugees for a range of things, it is important that we are providing on our area and appearance fees whenever possible. It is a way, there is a way to make these more meaningful um, if, and, and again, this is something that Hafsar mentioned, if there can be some skills development, some training, some offered alongside um, work at, 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 as um, speakers or engaged in conferences, um, as rapporteurs or whatever it may be, to, but to be thinking about when those positions are, are available with, within our organizations and to be deliberately reaching out to make them available to people from forced displacement backgrounds, in particular through contact through RLOs and RLIs. It's also important for us all to think um, about, and I'm gonna consider these two things together, um, regional and global structures and, and consultancy agreements. Um, th there's a very important example happening here in this part of the world at the moment with the civil war in Myanmar and the withdrawal of many I INGOs from Myanmar. Many continue to operate, but provide cross-border services, um, cross-border assistance. And some continue to operate with staff based in Myanmar, but employed using consultancy agreements from regional and global offices. Again, this emergency context has created possibilities to consider the employment of people with lived experience backgrounds, people in those settings, and people with experience of those settings and, and, and the things going on to employ them 
um, to employ them directly. Um, it is, uh, I think, I've put here outsourcing. It's 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 a it's not a pleasant term, um, and this is something which um, is it, it's an unway an unkind way of describing a bad way of of contracting with um, refugee led organisations in order to implement projects and to include that within your own refugee leadership and participation efforts without thinking about the other supports um, that need to go alongside um, those mechanisms. Um, I'm, uh, I'm gonna talk much later uh, about, about some other things, but just to touch on risk and compliance here. And, and this is um, directed two ways. Um, it is, as Hafsar mentioned, it's incredibly important to consider um, th the potential risks um, of recruiting refugees and offering the, the support in terms of secondary traumatization and so on. But, but really, when we think about, um, about risk, um, we, we all need to consider the environments that we work in. And in those environments where um, very clear legal work rights for, for recognized refugees don't exist. Um, you need to seek advice. You need to understand from partners and from RLIs what they're doing. And you need to work on your appetite for risk. Um, and I would argue that these programmatic changes in places like Myanmar and Thailand and indeed in Afghanistan have illustrated that in certain settings, we can increase our appetite for, um, for risk to improve participation and effective programming. I'm gonna stop right there. Thank you so much, Chris, for starting us off on some clear pathways, knowing the big why, and also understanding risk and compliance and its role um, and, and overcoming legal challenges. We want to launch a poll. Julia, you can pop it up for everybody. This is a two question poll. It's anonymous. And we're just asking to what extent you have confidence in your institution's abil ability to enable those first two pathways. We're gonna give you just two minutes to respond to this and then we'll look at the results together. Okay, so uh, for this first question about the big why, it looks like we're about 60% feeling confident and making sense of that. And they 38% somewhat confident. Uh, and then for the question about overcoming risk associated with hiring people of force displacement, uh, distribution a little bit different, 43% highly confident and 55% somewhat confident. Um, Chris, when you look at these, these findings, are you surprised? And do you have any additional advice you could offer those who said, you know, somewhat confident for either of these? I was... I was quite surprised by by the high percentage um, of, of in the first answer of of really understanding um, the big why. Um, what I have found from from personal experience is is when when you begin that journey, it it feels as if it's it, it it's a journey that you will be on for a, for a long time, perhaps um, forever. And, and I certainly feel about that myself in terms of understanding um, some of the nuances, the, um, the ingrained and supported power imbalances between um, uh, forci forcibly displaced co-workers and other co-workers. Um, I, I think that that is, is something that we all have to constantly be working on and thinking about and have to be very de deliberate and proactive about. Um, so yes, I, I I was surprised by that because, um, and and certainly I I I'm not giving anything away. Um, I think when I when I say I put my own organisation in in the middle categories um, both times, I I think being for for those of us who work in organisations, big organisations, um, communicating with with your your global structures um and and beginning that discussion 
but also um, for me, what's been important is having um, the support of uh, of our DEI um, team um, here at CWS. And so um, those discussions are ongoing. Um, yes, thanks, Diana. Thanks, I wanna ask Hafsar for their reaction as well. But bef before I do that, if anybody with, is interested in coming off mute, and you were somebody who said, you know, somewhat confident, you'd like to share what's happening in your institution as a case study for us all to hear some wisdom from Chris and Hafsar, please raise your hand and we'll call on you in a minute. Also, please feel free to put your questions in chat. But Hafsar, over to you. What is your reaction when you look at these poll findings? Oh, there was also a hand. Do you want to go for that hand first? No, please. Let's hear your reaction and then we'll go to Jasmine. Okay. Yeah, my reaction is... um. It's good to see that the majority of organizations are um, confident, the first one, but then I'm not surprised as well to see a little bit of less confident in terms of the um, the second questions. So it is something that I'm, I am hoping to address as well in my um, second part of speaking later on um, when we have discussion as well. Um, and I'm also hoping we can together in discussion with other people here, attendees, participants as well, uh, can explore that. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Uh, Jasmine from Pillnet, it's so nice to see you. Please what tell us what's on your mind. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, so thanks. I mean, I think these, I didn't join last time's session, but it was fantastic. I watched it on YouTube and I'm very excited about this one. Um, so we are still at Pillnet, um, you know, fairly new in, I would say, this DEI journey. But I, I will say that one of the things we have managed to um, get a bit more traction on, because at least those in the force displacement team really see the value in the why in terms of recruitment and hiring. Um, so we have in the last year managed to hire three uh, people with lived experience of displacement, and that was not without it risk, its risks. So, um, I mean, I think just what, as you said, sort of speaking to partners and trying to uh, identify ways that we could minimize the risks is something that I think is is really useful. But I also want to share, I think there's, um, in terms of the, we have to think about the risks for the organization and also the risks for the individual involved. Because quite frankly, we were quite happy to take on some risks as the organization. It's all of the refugees we hired are working on consultancy agreements in countries where we don't have offices. So um, the risk to us of, the police catching us or something happening to us and us not being able to operate is actually really limited, we, we, we think, we believe. But the risk to our staff um, is much higher. And I think that's maybe something to kind of factor in when we think about the risks, the risk for the organisation and the risk for the staff. Um, so as I said, we reached out to some people on the staff piece. Um, on the risk for the organisation piece, I just wanted to actually offer something up in case it's useful. For those that don't know Pillnet, we um, broker legal assistance for civil society organizations. And so we actually have had NGOs um, who are looking to recruit refugees uh, come to us and say, could you match us up with a law firm? And can we have a look at that risk? What is that risk? And are there some alternatives? So we're happy if any of you are thinking about that and you're not sure what your risk is and your appetite and whether there's some alternatives and you want some legal advice, happy. Um, just, I wanted to offer that up. Happy for you to come to us and I can put that in the chat. Then I'll come to my question, um, which was in terms of sort of the inclusion piece, because we have hired now successfully three refugees and that's been fantastic experience in terms of the why it's obvious in terms of impact and things like that. But when we came to that part of recruitment, I was really stuck on like, okay, how do we now include, right? And I reached out to quite a few people saying, are there any guides, any tools? Like, I want to do a good job of this and I don't know if I'm doing a good job of this. So I'm just really keen to know if after the session, if there's going to be, if that's in the pipeline, if there are any organizations that are looking at sort of guides for how do we include uh, refugees within our work. And particularly, I'm thinking about those of us, I mean, I work in an organization where we do forced displacement work, but we also do other work. And so the forced displacement team very much sees the value. And I think we've, we're much more attuned to some of these issues. But there's whole other parts of our organization that maybe doesn't get the why quite so much and also needs more information about and, and more tools on inclusion because they won't necessarily be working with them in the same way. Um, and I, again, I guess one other thing is 
the community, like, yeah, just other teams and how do you get other teams, like communications teams, people who work with them in a more operational way, but maybe not in a programmatic way, who, who how do you sort of share tools or resources with them as well? So anyway, quite a lot there. Happy to put myself Thank out. You. <laughs> Thank you, Jasmine. Thank you for coming off mute. Okay. Um, it's you, you set us up so perfectly for the next set of this conversation, um, because we're definitely going to be talking on, about inclusion and onboarding. But there was something you said that I wanted to get Hafsar an opportunity to respond to, which was around the taking on a personal risk. Hafsar, did you have thoughts around Jasmine's comments around, well, what about the risks for the individual? What about them, that that, that person, that personal forces placement who is coming into this new job and, and they may not have all the legal protections available to them? What is your response to this concern? Absolutely, there, there is risk because <clears throat> when I was in Malaysia, it, it did not sign Convention 1951. It means if you're working, you are seen um, as you're doing something against the law. Simply because you are working, you can be arrested and detained. So when we when we go out, even if when we are on the way to work, we cannot let the police know or the authorization of Malaysia know that we are working. So there is a risk involved as well for the individual. So for the bigger question of how do we combat this risk for the individual and for the organization, I think it's still in work in progress that we still have to brainstorm together. But I do believe it is possible. Um, there was a, I would say the risks involved for the organization versus individual, and I would argue that the risks involved for the individuals is a lot higher, where particularly the individuals are not legally protected in those country and don't have any legal protection from such country, because if a refugee in in the country context of Malaysia is arrested and detained, there is no access to the detention. Also, risks involved including deportation, which also then end with the um, very terrible um, outcomes after being deported to countries like Myanmar. So yeah, that's a bigger question that uh, we should be brainstorming and working on discussing. Yes, thank you. And I know conversations around informed consent can be hugely helpful on this con in this context as well. I'm gonna move us forward because unsurprisingly we're behind time. So Chris, I wanna come back to you and everybody, we're gonna have another Q and A. So tee up your questions, please. But I want to come back to you, Chris, assuming that an organization can get past this concern around the big why and can get past some of the legalities and feel like they have actual concrete modes of hiring somebody. What else is there to think about around recruitment, hiring and onboarding? Can you add to the pathways for us? Thanks, Diana. Um, yes, um, absolutely, I can. Um, and, and Jasmine's question, question just to, just to, to mention, was was a great one, and, and got to some of the the core issues that that, that we we deal with. Um, Jasmine, I know that some organisation have done practical safety sessions for refugee staff living in in settings um, that you're describing. Um, at other organizations that I've worked with, there's also been um, a, an assurance of additional support. So a, a, an organization that I worked for that included legal representation in case of arrest um, because there were lawyers available on staff and because they could respond 24 seven. But there are. But trying to think about those additional things, I think, is important. Um, apologies, I'm, I'm now going to move on to identifying um, some additional pathways. And, and the third pathway that I'm recommending, which is something that we can all do, which can improve, um, help us to improve inclusion, is not enough on its own, um, and improve recruitment of, um, of people with lived experience backgrounds. And that is we need to address um, our biases in recruitment. And this is actually something that's um, much more difficult to do because uh, these biases are generally unconscious. And so thinking critically about our recruitment processes is really important. They tend to be Western models imported into other parts of the world. Um, and they tend to be, as a result of that, they tend to be very qualification specific, for example. 
Um, what I would encourage all of us to do as organizations is to, is to think about, to vision the person that we would like to see in the role um, that is currently vacant. And not and 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 to think about the attributes, the personality, the skills that that person might have. Um, what is absolutely essential? What is what is needed? To to think about those things rather than qualifications. At organisations that I've worked for, what what we did was removed formal education. Um, requirements from our um, from our jobs um, it, automatically when we're, when we're writing vacancy announcements I it, it's sort of an automatic um, thing for us to do to to, to say um, master's degree or uh, undergraduate degree or five years of, of professional experience in paid employment in such and such an organization challenge these assumptions. Um, also think critically about um, language abilities, for example. Um, in many roles, oral communication is far more important than written communication, yet we rely on written communication more often than not as the threshold level to decide who should get an interview. And so thinking about and talking about um, what is key for you in this particular role? And, and perhaps um, oral communication in English um, is absolutely essential. And that somebody with a lower level of, of written communication can actually perform well in the role and you can put in place additional training and support to help that person improve once in the role. Um, it's also important in a number of, of situations in which I've worked, um, UN agencies and INGOs, when I, when I work leading refugee-led organizations, whilst over a period of time going from, from being resistant or hostile to, to supportive, there was always um, not, there was often um, challenges made to, refu to, to people from lived experience in backgrounds, and in that particular instance, it was people currently living as refugees, that they lacked the impartiality, the ability to be confidential, um, the financial integrity, um, or the representativeness, that they were from a particular community and not, um, not all communities or, or not multiple communities or would be seen to be from that community. All of these have been used to challenge the recruitment and, and the hiring of, of refugee um, experience in positions. Um, some of the, the examples in the past have been particularly bad. Um, for example, um, praising one organization that I worked with, but then um, seeking assurances that we weren't going to employ people with lived experience in our finance department because the encouragement to, to theft was just too great um, for people of lived experience, but was, was something that others would be more easily able to, to withstand. Um, this brings me on, on to my next um, point. Um, recruit really um, um, collaboratively, relationally. Um, so merely saying we, we welcome um, refugees to apply for this position um, is just not going to increase the level of, of, of um, refugee applications um, for that particular vacancy. It is, um, it is a challenge and it is a, a challenge that I've faced everywhere that I've worked to get people from lived experience backgrounds um, to encourage them to create an environment where they feel confident enough to apply for positions for which they're very capable of fulfilling those vacancies. And a lot of that is focused on, I just, they're never gonna employ me, or I don't, I never finished school, or I, I just don't have the experience or, or whatever it might be. Um, and doing particular um, outreach work and encouragement work through social media, through the vacancy itself can be really, um, can be really useful 
um, in, in increasing the levels of, of application. Um, in a number of organizations that I've worked for, we reserved positions for people. It was a requirement, um, a job specification that lived experience of forced displacement um, was, was a requirement um, within that. Even within that setting, it can be challenging, um, particularly I'm talking here about Global South um, settings and, and at, at management and senior levels, um, to get to, to, to create that, that environment that refugees and people with lived experience backgrounds feel confident enough about to think it's worthwhile, meaningful to apply, and, and that once in these organizations, that they will be able to be effective and enjoy career development, something that's also incredibly important. Um, and so offering insurances and information um, can support in that way. Understanding the process um, that you're asking for in applying. Again, I mentioned written applications for jobs which rely upon oral communication. Um, I have in the past worked with an organization where applications um, for, a, for a training course, which was, which was also paid, um, were done um, using, could be done using either an online video presentation that could be sent or a written application. And that then served to, to assess a different set of skills, but also gave um, opportunities to apply um, to people who don't have CVs, don't have resumes, and who would, would might not otherwise have accessed that, that process. Um, Adi Orr is, is going to, to, to speak um, about um, onboarding and, and, and the, the importance of, of inclusion. And um, I've mentioned that there is a, a challenge that, that we have to be really deliberate about the positions that we are considering um, either reserving or favoring lived experience. And, and these have to reach into the upper levels of organization. It was something that Hafsa was very clear on to me when I was at Apron and we were discussing this, um, that it's the senior level positions that matter most in creating um, or can matter most in creating meaningful change. Adil will, will, will uh, address onboarding, which is incredibly important as part of improving inclusion and the impact that um, lived experience staff are able to have on programming and the way that organizations function. Um, also incredible, last point, my seventh pathway is, is or my sixth pathway is, um, is for us all to talk to each other about those things that we're doing and that we're doing. And Jasmine mentioned this, you know, is there a guide? Um, and, and I know that um, Apron are, are working on, on their own learning on their journey as, as, as Hafsar um, really settles into, in, into their role. But and I understood Hafsa that the apron um, was 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 going to do something like this, perhaps, but maybe maybe I've misremembered that. But this talking to each other, understanding what each other are doing, understanding good practices identified, um, and working on relationships, but being mindful of the burdens that we might be placing on refugee-led organisations and and initiatives. And, and being supportive in return. My voice is just going, so I think that's my cue to be quiet. Thank you, Diana. Chris, thank you so much. And a reminder that, you know, Chris used this set of strategies to transform institutions and, and to uplift lived experience. So I think we can take them as a real roadmap. Um, and I'm also seeing that uh, Julia O'Doul from Refugee Led Research Hub put a great suggestion in the chat box. I wanted to point that out. But I am so excited to bring Adior into the conversation. Uh, so as Chris mentioned, we know that one of the keys to successful recruitment processes is in the onboarding process. It gets right to Julia's question as well. And I know, Adior, that you have been working on this in your current role at Cohere. So what can you share with us about what works and what doesn't work in onboarding? 
Well, hi everyone. My name is Adiora Ibrahim. Uh, I've met some of you, some of you not so much. I work with POHIA as the DEI Programs Assistant for the last one year. I'm talking today because as a junior staff with post-displacement background, I have a lived experience of what works and what doesn't work, just like um, Diana has mentioned. And this in regards to onboarding of junior refugee staff, and this is what I want to share with you today. When I started working for an NGO, uh, in this case, uh, Kohia, I realized that to create an environment where refugees can realize their full potential, onboarding has to go beyond conventional process. Uh, it requires patience, empathy, sensitivity, and proactiveness. And it is about dedicating time and effort that fosters a sense of belonging and equitable opportunities. This can involve introducing them to tools that you use and facilitating social integration while establishing an open and supportive environment to enhance their autonomy and productivity, just like Chris has mentioned before about having an inclusive environment. So what works and what doesn't work in onboarding refugee staff? For starters, what works is uh, check on their level of their familiarity with work culture. This can mean uh, setting clear tasks and expectations for new staff from the onset and make them uh, make the best use of the first few months of the probation period. That is for most people, that is about three months. Use that time to onboard them, make them feel at home, and also be curious about what the trainee is already comfortable with in terms of NGO working culture. This could mean how to write emails, use of bullet points, or even use of Google Drive. And if they are not already aware, you, there's a place for you to teach them. And this is why the first three months of the probation period are very crucial for an organization that is willing to hire people of post displacement as junior staff. Secondly, value their learning process and do not make them feel inferior while they learn. Instead, you should value their learning pathways and care about it. This will give a signal to them that you do care about them, about joining your organization. While at that, you can also recognize that what they are already good at. And as they learn new things, it, it will be great to be consistent in checking in regularly on how they are doing in terms of work and also on a personal level. You never know how they are they are doing uh, or how they are settling in. And lastly, it will be great to create a robust support system that they can tap into. This could mean assigning them a mentor who will focus on developing their skills and also holding the mentor accountable to the progress of the new staff. Another thing is assigning the refugee staff a body that will be focusing on their well being and will encourage the new staff to. Uh, apply for available educational and advancement opportunities. Uh, that is on what works. On the other hand, what does it work is not doing prior investigations to refugee documentation, which is something that Chris had already talked about. And also, uh, these investigations could also mean that you're not aware of alternative measures that are available, like if they don't have a bank account or health insurance. Something else is when you don't check on their well-being, and this could include when you keep things vague and not having clear job descriptions and expectations, and also assuming that they're settling in well without checking in on them, or even when they create a, when you create an environment where they do not feel comfortable talking, this could lead to lack of trust and making them feel inferior or demanding. Uh, it also doesn't work when you do not establish an accountability system for the mentor, uh, putting them in a bubble and with just the mentor and the staff and not checking in on the mentor if the bubbles are working or not. And lastly, it doesn't work when you are under investing in training and education at work, not having a training before joining. And like I mentioned again, the first three months of the probation period should be a period of them learning and just slowly easing in into the organization. 
to conclude, I want to finish by saying that most often people of forced displacement uh, struggle to access secondary education and even first employment. And these are the people you need most in your team because they know exactly the challenges that refugee face and how to tackle them. And if you want to have an impact that is closer to the communities you serve, uh, these are the exact people that you need to recruit and support uh, and support towards progressively accessing decision making of our programs. But this only um, this is the only condition that you can create a specific and robust onboarding process. And this is not only an HR responsibility. Again, it's a collective responsibility of the whole organization. And if you have a young refugee staff, you can ask yourself if they are doing well, if they are settling in well, and if there's something you can do to change or create a habit to contribute to their well-being and professional development. Ask them if they are if they feel okay, if they feel well, and show show up for them that you do care about how they are settling in well within the organization. Back to you, Diana. Thank you, Adior. I hear themes of communication, of care, um, of accountability, and thank you so much for for bringing clarity to a specific, uh, a very common experience for people. And last but not least on our panel, I want to bring it back to Hafsar. And Hafsar, I thought maybe you had, if there's anything you want to add to the onboarding, please start your answer with that. But the real question I really want you to unpack for us is, now that we have heard about these six pathways, we've gone pretty deep into some, some specific areas of inclusion that could be hard to get right. What are some common challenges that show up for institutions from your perspective as they're seeking to become more inclusive employers? And do you have any ideas for how you might address those challenges? Mm, that's a kind of million dollar question. <clears throat> but a couple of things is that um, in countries like, again, um, Malaysia or, or Thailand or in ASEAN, I'm speaking from the ASEAN perspective because that's where I have lived most of my life. It's again, uh, the laws that exclude um, people for being recruited because of their legal status as well as the UN convention, et cetera, so forth. Again, also Chris has very well eloquently explained about the traditional expectation of the people of first displacement requirement of such and such academic qualifications um, and legal status again and skills. Um, those are the common challenges as well as from the organizational perspective as well for some INGOs to have um, permission and consent to be based in certain countries, it requires a lot of uh, legal work. And then there was a risk of um, compromising their ability to be based in those countries, uh, particularly in countries, again, speaking of in, in countries in Asia where they don't have UN convention signed, but then big INGOs like UNXCI and other INGOs have to really advocate hard to be able to be based in those countries as well. So there's a number of things. But then I have also seen it is almost impossible to deliver the work that they do for refugees and forcibly displaced um, men issue without having people of forced displacement and refugees on board. They need, they need these people to deliver the work that they do. So I have seen INGOs have had people of forced displacement um, in some way or another. Um, although there is there is uh, this barrier of being able to recruit them legally and openly, but there has been recruitment. But one thing that I've been always curious is, um, I'm gonna be very open here, um, very curious is, is that now you have these people on board, you do need them. And I know, I acknowledge the fact that you cannot openly recruit them, but there is an element of not, uh, these people of forced displacement not getting paid equally to others who are being recruited legally. So either way you are having them, you're using their skill and their resources and human resources and time, you can still have them in, in your work and organization one way or another, why there is one, one thing that you cannot do. So from the perspective of an activist and advocate, <laughs> as a human rights defender, it doesn't make sense to me. So this is something that I I'm very curious and would like to know more because 
I've seen in, in, in Malaysia, in big ING and UNXIA, if there is interpreter, local interpreter and a translator, the level of uh, amount of money they get paid and the refugee or first displaced person get paid is not the same. But then you are still using their skill and time. So it doesn't make sense to me. It's a, a huge, big gap. So there's also something that I think if, if there is a will, something that can possibly be improved because you're having them either way in countries, contexts like that. And the other way, um, the other minor challenges are, um, again, as going back to complementing the point that Chris has mentioned, if we are going to get this uh, people of forcibly displaced and refugee background to invest a little bit of mentoring or to innovatively think about how do we utilize their skill and expertise um, and then thinking about complementary to other without the experience in the organizational, uh, in the organization, within the organization to create better outcomes. So that require a little bit of thinking and investment, which is not impossible. Again, it's very possible. Um, the other challenge as well um, is that it, now people are talking about this meaningful participation and then people now feel a little bit of now if we are going to have all the people with live experience and forcibly displaced people where do the people without live experience gonna go <laughs> there is a little bit of inevitable resistance to this meaningful participation although there is overwhelmingly positive support so there is another minor challenge just now now i understand whenever there is a change there is a little bit of um resistant and welcoming as well as people struggling to fit into the change coming along even if we know that the change is going to bring a lot of positivity there so how do we address that as i i i think i don't know there is one set uh, answer but there are a couple of things that i would recommend to do is that creating opportunities for people with forcibly displaced and refugees um, to be empowered, to build their capacity on top of the valuable expertise and skill that they bring as the people will have experience. Just to make them feel um, that they are they are equally valuable to others without life experience because otherwise there was still, I've seen again and again, there was still this power dynamic. Even if you are being recruited um, most of the time, refugees and forci forcibly displaced people are recruited for the lower level or entry level of the staff of the organization, they are never being considered as the leadership position, or they are not um, given the confidence and benefit of a doubt that they might be able to do um, such great work and be hired in the leadership positions, even if they don't bring such and such traditional requirement of uh, academic qualification. So that's, those are a couple of things that we could do. Um, as well, going back to the fear of now, if people of lived experience and forcibly displaced people are going to come on board, and if we're going to do a lot of meaningful participation, are we going to lose our job? And are we what, what, what is our space? So going, going back to that, I can speak from the perspective of lived experience. I have never once envisioned this space to be heavily influenced by only by people with lived experience. What I envision is just to uh, reclaim our space because it is rightfully the space for the people with lived experience. If we are if we are claiming or demanding to be included in the work that is not related to us, it is not fair acts. But if it is something about us, if people are um, um, requesting, can we be a part of this? I think it is a fair act, and it is something that we need to seriously think about it. It doesn't take away the space of people without live experience. It just have to be thinking about okay now. If we're going to have these people with live experience and forcibly displaced people to lead us, to guide us, where do I stand now? With all the expertise and um, skill that I bring, um, what is the space of people without live experience to enable these people with live experience to do to be our equal partner? There is no such power dynamic. There is no either or. It is equally existing together. Um, I also will argue there is also one other element that I keep hearing about. Okay, now, if we are going to fund a lot of RLOs, other INGOs and NGOs are also struggling to secure their funding. So how does it going to unfold? <laughs> I would argue with or without having RLOs, we're still going to have this issue. Having RLOs and empowering them and creating pathway for them to be able to access to funding and resources is not going to undermine our ability to tap to funding. In fact, what I do believe is that if we come up with the creative and innovative ways, we're even going to go getting more sustainable and um, funding 
that will make more sense to the donors and as well as that will uh, create more positive and long lasting impact. Um, what, what I will envision is that at some point, if I'm without live experience, if I'm in, in other people's space, if I see these people live experience are so capable and as someone, they don't even need me in their space. I will not have that fear of losing my job, but I will rather feel like I have done my job really well. And these are the success indicator. But again, I'm not suggesting at all. People with early experience go home and sleep now. No, what I am merely suggesting is that uh, we have to think about coexisting and, and doing together in a partnership level without ha having that inferiority or superiority or either or concept but rather thinking about um, how do we do this together and bringing these people of first displacement on board and refugees on board um, to have better impact. Um, with that, I also wanna talk about this little bit of um, change together with Chris Eid um, when he was the Secretary General, I was the chair that we bring to- I'm sorry, about one Secretary. minute left. Okay, okay. Um, this co-leadership model, me now being at this co-Secretary General, um, I am someone with live experience. We have another co-Secretary General without live experience, but at this point, I haven't seen so far this power dynamic between us. But I also have to tell you that this journey of co-leadership model has not yet the perfect one, but I we, I am hoping we will constantly share this um, as a showcase and a models of work in progress so we can replicate um, thinking about how do we have people with live experience in leadership position, in decision-making seat, not just having them at the entry level. And then how does this unfold? Does it bring any positive impact? Is there any challenges? How did we overcome? So this is something exciting. And of course, there are some resistance as well, while we have overwhelmingly positive welcoming. So I also want to bring that forward. And um, yes, it has been so far exciting and, and challenging, <laughs> but I, I look forward to share that with uh, many of you here and also continue this conversation. This is not one of conversation that we have. And I think onboarding issues will be something that we have to unfold and unpack together and should be ongoing discussion. Over. Thank you, Hafsar. So many great comments happening in the chat. And, you know, I think some of your comments, Hafsar, harken back to the first session. If you didn't watch the first session, go check it out. Um, a lot of discussion about, of course, there's room for allies, assuming that you're operating as allies. Um, I want to now uh, launch a second poll and move us into our second Q&A conversation. Uh, this second poll, yeah, go ahead, Julia, is, is also trying to understand our competence with overcoming some of the, um, the challenges that have been brought up from Chris and on our comfort with, um, uh, uh, enabling these pathways. So we're going to give you just two minutes to answer these three questions, and then we'll come back, look at the findings and do take another couple of questions. Okay. So, very interesting for the first one about 50-50 split on, on confidence related to mitigating bias. On the second question, a bit more confidence around being able to recruit collaborati collaboratively with communities. And the third one, even more confidence related to um, being able to create inclusivity. Uh, Chris, I want to start with you. Uh, curious about your reaction to you know the least confidence being present around mitigation in bias and recruitment? Um, <clears throat> again, I'm, and maybe I'm, I'm a terrible human being um, and, and um, full, of, full of unconscious biases and conscious biases. Um, but again, I'm, um, I'm aware that, that we as human beings have these um, and um, being part of the movement for refugee leadership and participation, lived experience leadership and participation, there's been a, a, a massive learning experience for me in terms of understanding my own biases and understanding the Western way of doing things and trying to, to think about why are we doing this in 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 the global south um, and and what can we do what can we do about it? Um, again. Um, I'm 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 super pleased um, that people are um, are confident about it, and and that gives us a lot of hope in terms of enhancing, improving um, levels of, of of lived experience recruitment and and representation, meaningful representation, um, as as Hafsar said. Um, yeah, over. 
If you were somebody who put somewhat confident and you would like to share what your experience has been around any of these pathways, please raise your hand and we'll give you an opportunity to, to share your challenge and get some, some reflections from our experts. We have one question for Adior. Um, Adior, uh, sometimes institutions are saying, you know, investments in human resources or operations are overhead and they're hard to make. And we know that onboarding takes time, energy, and time and energy is money. So I'm wondering what your reaction is to this, to this concern, to this comment. You know, how high on the priority list does this kind of investment sit for you? Well, um, well, investment in HR and operations, especially in the areas of recruiting and onboarding, should be considered high priority. They are not just overhead costs. They are integral, and they create a strong sort of belonging and uh, a foundation for the success of our organization particularly one dealing with uh, individuals of forced displacement. So I would say a very high priority. And you know they say what the saying goes like, if you keep your employees happy, your organization is likely to succeed. And HR and operations are the biggest part. They actually make up the organization. So if you don't invest in that and think of it as an uh, overhead cost, I don't know how to feel about that. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. You know, Hafsar, there's a set of comments in the chat box that I would love to hear your response to, mostly around um, the broader system being inequitable. So either that, you know, work rights are a struggle and how are we banding together to enable work rights? Questions about, you know, the general uh, pay structures excluding or um, uh, devaluing lived experience. So there's the, the refugee pay versus the expat pay dynamic that is alive and well. Um, what wisdom do you have to offer the room around how we as institutions wanting to advocate for equity, what can we do around this and how should we be operating? not one of the six pathways because it's not one of the practical pieces of guidance here, but it's on everybody's mind. So how do we think about it? Well, I'm I'm going to also echo to Chris's point is that um, it is not going to, it will be unrealistic dream if we're going to achieve equitable uh, response for all as a macro level, but we can start from the micro. The very least, what I would like, one of the comments that I've seen um, in the chat box as well is the same when I was a refugee. They, they call it reimbursement. They don't even call it um, salary or such for your work, for the work that I did as well. So there is a type of agreement between the contractor of this INGO that work for mainly with refugees and forcibly displaced people. I'm speaking about those. I mean... It is not also excuse for other um, local organization and people to exploit refugees and forcibly displaced people, but particularly if we are working for human rights, if we are an organization that practice human rights based approach, we have to as well do this conscious uh, reflection over and over again. Are we actually practicing it? We can start from the micro level of practical things like um, equity in payment for refugees and non-refugees and forcibly displaced people. It is doable. Um, when we, now that I'm in this space for a while now, when we, we write a budget proposal, you could include that. And that now the donors are somehow being educated and there is some flexibility around that. Because one thing that I've seen is that there was a huge gap from the local and refugees, <laughs> between locals and refugee stuff. Forget about the expert. It's, expert is the next level. I don't even have to explain you. It's the next level of like, Refugees and forcibly displaced people have to work about 10 months to get one month salaries of expert. It is the next level, but I'm speaking about local and other who have legal status. This is something that is achievable. We can start doing that as well as it is a way of giving a method for the survival in a dignified way for refugees and forcibly displaced people in many countries. 
refugees are not allowed to work. And then there is no such system. Refugees are not also living in the refugee camp. There is no social welfare. By creating this uh, micro changes and equal pay system, you are going to allow these refugees and forcibly displaced people to have dignified employment as well as to live their life in a more human way, not in an inhuman way. When you have this pay inequity, it is really um, dishonoring and failing to acknowledge their contribution to the work that we do as an NGO and organization. We have to be constantly reflecting that we can start from the micro level on a bigger scale to have changes on the macro, macro level. Of course, we have our collective responsibility to still advocate for the work rights of forcibly displaced people and refugees. Again, going back to my uh, first point that I mentioned in the first part of um, where I was speaking about resilience building, combating narrative change of refugees and forcibly displaced people, social economic inclusion. This is These are the bigger um, advocacy aim and macro level that we can work on together as well. Um, I'll, I'll stop here. Thank you, Hafsar. We have just a few minutes for discussion. So I'm gonna hand it over to Julia to introduce our breakout rooms. Thank you, Diana. Um, so uh, we'll soon open the breakout rooms, but before that, I'd like to uh, invite you to please take a moment to have a look at the screen, screen and to screenshot or take a picture of the slide, the previous slide, um, please. Thank you. Uh, the slide that is listing the pathways discussed by uh, our experts, you can use this slide as a resource to guide you through uh, your breakout room discussion. So while you proceed with taking the picture, quick reminder of the community agreements uh, around this workshop. Please don't interrupt one another. Listen with an open mind. If someone hasn't spoken yet, please invite them to share what's on their mind. If you're able to turn on your cameras, please do. If you're willing to be vulnerable, please try it. Respect one another's privacy. Don't share beyond the room unless you get explicit permission. And of course, try to share contact information with one another if you want to stay in touch. Um, so for the breakout room guidelines, uh, please prepare to um, open the Miro board. Uh, next, next slide, please. To uh, to open the Miro board link that my colleague Daniel uh, will share in the chat now. Uh, this board will help you to take notes during your discussions, but please stick with me for a few seconds as I introduce you to the to the breakout room guidelines uh, and to the mirror board. So in the breakout room, you can start by introducing yourself, your organization, and share why you joined today, and then you can brainstorm together. What is one thing that you might take up in your organization, or what potential obstacles or challenges do you anticipate encountering as you implement the pathways? And you can also uh, brainstorm on the questions that you still have and you hope to get answers to. Each person will share and then solicit feedback from fellow uh, participants. Welcome back everybody. Uh, as a final step here, we just wanna give our speakers one minute to give any final closing thoughts or nuggets of wisdom for our uh, community here to take away. Hafsar, can I come to you first for your one minute wrap up? Well, my one minute wrap up is um, the, the things that we discussed today. Um, it's a bigger question of how and when and how do we do this? But I, I have confidence that we can move to the right direction if we genuinely um, try through learning and sharing our experiences and peer learning in this space and beyond. And this conversation being not only the one-off conversation and engagement and continuing our engagement on, in this space, together with INGOs and people of forced displacement themselves to further uh, thinking through innovative ways of minimizing the risks and in, in implementing this. Thanks, Hafsar. And Adior, what is your final one minute wrap up? I'm really glad that we are in a space of speaking about hiring, recruiting, and onboarding refugees. It's uh, a fresh breath, if I may say, and just going ahead and making use of uh, the talents that you already have to have uh, an onboarding that is intentional for these people that are joining your community. You never know how much lives that you're already changing by just doing that and being intentional about it. And 
you never know. You might be one step closer to uh, solving the challenges and crises that refugees are facing right now. That's my one minute. Back to you, Diana. Thank you. I felt that, Adior. Thank you. And uh, last but not least, Chris, final thoughts? One thing that, that I would um, probably say um, to end um, is something which, which came across really clearly in, in the breakout session that I was in um, and which come, has come across um, very clearly in this session is um, that organisations who do not have staff with lived experience of forced displacement need to reach out to those communities and refugee-led organisations and initiatives and be willing to learn from them. But the only way that we can fully... Um, fully design inclusive programs that work on inclusion and are successful that way is by constantly being self-critical, critical of our organizations um, and, and trying to understand our own and uh, our own biases and, and addressing those. Um, one final thing I would say is incorporating the experiences um, that we've had in 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 this meeting and other experiences would be a wonderful thing to do and and having having a, a report bringing in the experiences of um so many organizations across the world engaged now in the movement for refugee leadership and participation we need that that's what we need we we, we need that 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 guide that collection of of tools and and methods tried thanks Chris, Adior, Hafsar, thank you so much. And back to you, Julia, for final comments. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us today. Um, please take a time to fill the exit survey that my colleague Daniel is sharing. It will take you uh, five minutes, and I will also uh, send it via email in the next hour in case you didn't get the time to open it now. Um, <clears throat> we hope you had an insightful experience and that you feel that you can uh, walk away with sufficient information to inform your uh, organizational journey, your own journey, but also your organizational journey in its pursuit of um, promoting meaningful participation and refugee leadership through recruitment and hiring of people for displacement. I want to reiterate lastly that uh, this workshop is part of a five uh, part workshop series and the next session will focus on equitable partnerships and it is scheduled for January. So please stay tuned for this upcoming session and feel free to invite uh, relevant colleagues. Many thanks again and I look forward to seeing you at our next session. Thank you everyone. <laughs>